Good morning, colleagues, and thank you for taking time to join me for this year's academic plenary. Because I'm a no pretense person, uh, we may have had a false start. Um, I might have been a mute when we started, but here we go. In today's program, I want to share information with you on two levels. One level will be some practical nuts and bolts information about proceeding with our work in a COVID-19 environment. And to that end, you'll hear from both Dr. Rich Turner and Dr. Mark Bosey about some practical information that I hope will help you launch and carry out a successful semester. At the same time, even while facing the challenges of COVID-19, I also want to spend a few minutes reflecting on the big picture work of the college. And so the other function of today's plenar plenary as in prior years, is to hopefully give you some perspective and a sense of direction about the opportunities that lay before us as a college that aspires to fulfill its mission as fully as possible, and frankly, to become one of the best community colleges in the United States. As Dr. Abandano shared at Conv uh, Convocation, the highly regarded Aspen Institute ranks us as one of the top 150 community colleges in the country but we all know that he is a top 10 kind of guy. Earlier today, we had the opportunity to hear Dr. Avendano share his thoughts and vision about the new year. In a nutshell, he said we're doing a lot of things well, but we can do better. We're gonna continue that conversation in academic affairs today. As college president, he has a tremendous amount to balance both inside and outside of the institution. And as he pursues that complex work, we should all be comforted and inspired by knowing we have a college leader who puts a premium on the role of teaching and learning, which I've heard him many times referred to as our core technology. I appreciate his time this morning and all he has done to point us in the right direction and advance our educational mission. With that, let me turn it over to our president, Dr. John Avendano. Dr. A. Thank you, Dr. Wall, and good morning once again, FSCJ family. Thank you for joining us this morning for the academic plenary. It's truly an honor to be part of that again this year. I want to thank you for allowing me to be part of the uh, agenda here today. I want to just say a few comments. One, I want to focus on my appreciation to all of you. The last five or six months have been something that no one has a textbook for in terms of how you prepare but everyone rose to the occasion to do whatever was needed to be done to help serve our students and to help serve each other. I cannot express my appreciation to all of you enough for the work that you did in the time that you had to be able to prepare for our students. We've had some time to prepare for the start of the fall term, and so I know we've learned some lessons in the process. With that, we know that we're gonna to continue to be challenged, but I know that we're up for the challenge. We'll continue to overcome any obstacles that come our way, because we have a role to fill and a mission to fulfill. So again, I wanna thank you on behalf of the Board of Trustees and all of your colleagues and the students that are coming through our doors on Monday. I thank you for your commitment to FSCJ, your commitment to your discipline, your commitment to serving our students. I wanna wish you a safe and successful fall term and an outstanding school year. So thank you for allowing me to be part of this and I look forward to seeing you all real soon. Thank you. Dr. Wall. Thank you, Dr. Avendano. Colleagues, in choosing the title plot points for today's academic plenary, I'm co-opting a term that I hope might stick with you and carry forward two important points as we move forward this year. A plot, of course, is a series of events that moves action forward. So allow me to set the stage for where we might go by looking back at where we've been with a few snippets from prior year's plenaries. First, there are three fundamentals that I hold as true and central to our work. They are that everything we do should be in the service of fulfilling our mission as fully as possible. 
Second, I believe that when it comes to teaching and learning, there is a sweet spot that every instructor should aim for where uncompromising rigor overlaps with engaging rapport with students. And third, I believe that we as academics are a special breed of professional and that we thrive in what I refer to as a vibrant academic culture. As I have mentioned before, that's hard to define, but we know it when we see it and we need to pursue it for the good of our own well-being and for that of our students. Two other elements that I have promoted in our collective work in prior years are a commitment to consistent process improvement and the notion that we should set the fences as wide as possible in supporting faculty as they creatively engage the business of teaching and learning. As we entered the last year, having made progress in our processes and in our academic culture, and even in our enrollments, I set out a challenge for us as individuals and professionals and as academic programs to begin to aim higher and pursue summits or new heights in achievement. In that regard, last year was very successful. I won't be able to name them all. I'm gonna start with one that's very mundane. I'm happy to say that as we look back at last year, we have to do a report every year to the state. It'll go to the Board of Trustees in September. It has to do with our compliance with textbook adoptions. We have to take care of it in a timely manner. It's something that we've had trouble with We were man we able to cut the number of late adoptions in half, more than in half, from 10% down to 4%. It's not exciting, it's not glamorous, but it's important because it affects our students, it affects the quality of our institution, and it takes all of us working together. Now something that's a little more exciting is this week you saw an announcement that went out that shared that Dr. Tina Dashi has come on or taken the role as faculty coordinator for our International Center for Education. This work, international education, is something that we have been at for the last couple of years. And internally, there have been some well-placed doubters who said, are we ever going to get there and do anything meaningful? Tina's taking that role, and all the work that has come up to that point shows that we are on the right path. In fact, I'm so disappointed that coronavirus is going to interrupt our capacity to take our first uh, international trips with students that we were planning to, to launch this year. I will say this, though. It's nice that it's a switch between our own internal things that are keeping us from achieving these heights and external constraints. We are moving in the right direction. This year, we've also welcomed our largest cohort in our honors program, 28 students, the most diverse group that we have ever had. You heard today about our Bridges grant where we've laid out 75 roadmaps for different programs. This year, we had a summer musical theater experience live right here that was broadcast over WJXT. We've developed and launched IDS 1107, the first step in a first year experience process for students. We've launched and continue to refine program review in our baccalaureate career and technical ed education programs. Over a half dozen of our programs received reaccreditation in the last year, and we've received, as you heard today in convocation, a number of grants, including a Florida Jobs Growth Grant of $3.6 million to focus on finance technology. That is a very big deal in our area, and the fact that we've been entrusted with those funds means that people have confidence in our ability to deliver. There's a lot more that we've done in terms of reaching those summits, but those are just some of the highlights, and I want us to stay and continue on that path. We we're looking forward to 2021, but unfortunately, coronavirus arrived. The text that you see here is from a 2012 interview in which Mike Tyson reflected on a famous quote that lives in various forms in our popular culture. Now, the famous quote to which I'm referring dates from 1997, and maybe some of you will recognize it. It was, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Because Iron Mike was such a ferocious competitor, it's popularly believed that he was talking about what happens to people when he hits them in the mouth. But as, we not, as he went on to explain years later, here in 2012, what he was actually referring to 
was his own capacity to adapt and to persevere when the punches were flying his way. Make no mistake about it. COVID-19 punched us and everyone else right in the face. And how did we respond as an institution? I would say with flying colors. I want to tell you, as your chief academic officer, I am filled with pride and awe at the way that you have responded to this crisis, individually and collectively. You all have kept on moving, innovating, doing what needs to be done, and doing it all with a positive can-do attitude. I knew we would have to rise to an occasion, rise to the occasion to make it work, but everything has surpassed my expectations. I want to sincerely thank you for all you have done and ask you to please remain committed and engaged as we move forward together. But now, even with the quick action and operational and pedagogical changes we've undertaken to keep things going, the last six months have made it clear that as an institution of higher learning, we have much more to think about than just surviving and adapting to a pandemic. Sometimes I'm on social media and I see jokes and memes about 2020 being a cursed year. But I'm among those who believe that there's an unsettling subtext and an unease or a dis-ease that the pandemic is bringing into sharp relief for us. The killing of George Floyd, which brought a sharper focus and a greater degree of urgency to persistent issues of racism and inequity of our society. The economic crisis that although surely ignited by the pandemic is laying bare the same questions about economic opportunity and social mobility. And these developments combined with schools not returning in person, some schools closing, some people wondering why they are spending exorbitant amounts of money on prestige signaling institutions along with questions about higher ed's relevance to employment, to life success, and social discourse, has put a spotlight squarely on us. As we return this year, there may be a temptation to say that all of those concerns are out there and that we can stay plugged into them in various degrees in our personal lives. And oh yeah, by the way, it's convocation week and I need to go back to FSEJ and do my job because fall is starting. And that really doesn't have anything to do with all that stuff. But I want to make the case today that these issues are local issues. Today's date, as Dr. Avendano shared at Convocation, is the 60th anniversary of Axe Handle Saturday. Here in Jacksonville, black protesters beaten by fellow citizens who objected not only to the protests, but to the underlying goals of the protests racial equality in our society. These issues are local issues, these issues are college issues, and these issues are current issues. And they go right to the heart of our mission in this community and how fully we fulfill that mission. For those of you who join FSCJ's On Point calls, it may ring a bell that Dr. Abadana has spoken about his sense that we are in a moment. Today, he talked about being at a moment in history, and I believe he is precisely right. I believe there are questions about our relevance as an institution. I believe there's an opportunity for us to make a difference. I believe that we are at a plot point in our story. The panel on inclusive excellence that Dr. Mary Lee Keneal hosted spoke to us the importance and the opportunity for us to recognize this moment as an institution. As trustee Mike Bell has pointed out, and I'm paraphrasing here, being a best kept secret isn't a great thing, is not a great thing for an institution. It's wonderful that once people get to know us, they're impressed by the work they do and they get inspired about the difference that we make. But if we do not own our own story, embrace that story, actively engage and expand our story in this moment, in this plot point, 
It's going to pass us by without FSCJ making the positive mark that it can in our community. So how do we do that? Not surprisingly, I'm gonna argue that the answer is rooted in attending to our mission. And what you see here is our mission distilled into three critical elements. And this is the second sense in which I would like to invoke the notion of plot points, except in an obviously different context. The points you see here are plotted to represent you and me and all of the services that we provide inside of our mission. And one thing that we know about our work is that it is collective. So let me share an incomplete version of our collective work. We all operate within the mission. Our marketing and recruitment bring students in who are then enrolled, advised, they take classes in communications and mathematics and humanities, the natural sciences, the social sciences, and other programs. They're taught by professors who are led by deans, and those professors have developed curriculum, and then they teach the curriculum in different sections, in a variety of sites across the colleges, in different modalities, and they describe how they do that in syllabi, and all of this happens for our students each and every term. And when a student makes their way through and connects all of those dots that are represented in this diagram, they end up with a transcript or a credential that if everything is working the way that it should, advances the student's capabilities and prospects as informed and productive citizens in our community. So this is a collective action. It takes all of us. But there is a kind of collective action that's called pooled interdependence, where each plot point just needs to be there and function and do its job and the whole thing will work. But now as I enhance the diagram, I hope that you can see the point that I wanna make before I say it. Because I believe that the way for us to go from good to great, the way for us to engage these conversations meaningfully, our secret sauce, the best way for us to advance the plot is if we take ourselves and push ourselves from just doing it collectively to doing things connectively. Please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we have an absence of connective action at our college. We see it in all kinds of places. Dr. A talked about examples today where we've come together to do great things. We have a lot of things we do in academics, our author series, our business speaker series, TEDx, our SLS conference, student research conference, our honors program, our nursing program, all highly integrated, connected experiences. But like Dr. A, I believe we can do more and I believe that we can do better. What I'm saying is that when you see connectivity at work is when we really shine. And there's a lot of room for us to do more connective action at FSCJ. And I believe that the more connective we are in our efforts, the better we'll serve our students and the more effectively we'll interact with our community and the more fully we will fulfill our mission. Now there are a couple of challenges in what I'm proposing. First, connective action is hard it takes time and it takes effort and emotional energy. I'm part of a group called the Academic Continuity Group that is meant to try to make things make sense and work operationally this fall. That group involves academic administrators, it involves faculty leadership, it involves other faculty who are interested and connected to these issues. And then we've reached out to include people from student success and facilities and IT as we have worked through the questions of what will it take to have a good semester. <laughs> I'm not proud of this, but we've had to meet 25 times at a pace of two times a week. It's painful, it's time consuming, it's also been highly productive and the right thing to do. That is connective action and I believe that we need more of it at FSCJ. Now the second challenge with connective action is that there's always a danger of complacency. The truth is that doing things connectively 
is almost always going to be completely optional for us. The truth is that we as a college can function adequately without being really deeply connected. Advisors advise, teachers teach, students run the gauntlet, and we all, after COVID, meet back at the arena for a graduation. But I believe that we can do better and that we should do better as an institution. This morning at Convocation, you heard about the strategic plan. You heard about my grad plan. You heard about my grad plan as a foundation for guided pathways here at the college. And in a few moments, you're going to hear about another connective program, a grant called Bridges. What all these things have in common is that they explicitly play on that notion of connectivity. So connective work is happening at FSCJ, but I want to put it on our agenda with intentionality in 2020, and I'll give you a few examples. As FSCJ moves to incorporate guided pathways into how we do our work, I invite your interest in that work by seeing it as a means of getting to comprehensive connectedness in the student experience. I'm trying to advance the slide. Oh, there we go, thank you. Guided pathways do involve course roadmaps, which you heard about today. But that's just the pathways part of guided pathways. The guided part of guided pathways refers to developing a coordinated and connected approach to working with our students as they move through their programs. As a professor of psychology, I fiercely guarded my academic freedom and scholarship in teaching. But what I didn't know and still don't know was how did the general psychology courses that I taught in terms of content coverage, in terms of rigor, in terms of downstream outcomes for the students who took me, how did that align with the peers I had who were teaching the very same courses? Achieving that understanding was a conversation I was certainly open to having as a faculty member, but I did not feel empowered to initiate it. This year, my intention is to empower us all to have those kinds of conversations. Let me give you an example about general education. When you think about the general education that we provide, what should it look like in a digital era in a society that's actively wrestling with questions about how do you determine what is true and what's not? Does science matter? Living in a community that despite its many strengths reflects the realities of a social and economic inequalities? Is our general education as relevant as it can be? On these questions, I'm going to issue a call this fall for us to spend some time in the spring, designing a connective plan in 2021 that we can execute in 2022. And what I want us to do in 2021 is not review general education, but figure out the plan for how are we going to review it? What are the connections that we need to make with our community, with our students, faculty to faculty, in order to evaluate and perhaps reshape our general education philosophy so that we make sure that it is absolutely relevant for today's world and its issues. Now that may all sound very liberal arts and sciences, so let me talk about the theme of connectivity with baccalaureate career and technical education programs. This year, we'll continue to learn much more about something called the BILT model, B-I-L-T business and industry leadership teams. BILTs are really evolved versions of what we call today advisory boards. But BILTs compared to advisory boards are built on, guess what? More connectivity and increased and systematic connectivity with industry partners so that we can collaborate on curriculum development and learning opportunities and employment placement for our students. And for all of us at the institution, I'm going to ask program and discipline councils to come together and spend some of your time and energy in connective conversations 
about what happens in different sections of the same course. Are they equivalent experiences for students? And how can we begin to look at those kinds of questions? These are not punitive conversations. I don't mean to suggest we're doing it wrong. We got to do what I want to say is I think we're on the right track. We can do more and we can do better. These are connective conversations. They're going to take more time. They really are optional, but they are the path to us becoming a better institution. My goal this year is to convene those conversations. I don't have an agenda on the outcome, except that people examine and design an inclusive environment that flows through our curriculum, our classes, and our activities. You all are a remarkable team. Our faculty are absolutely top notch. You blow me away. I'm so proud to be able to serve as your provost. I want to thank you for all you do. I want to wish you a great start to the academic year. And please know that my door is always open. Thank you very much. And with that, I'd like to pass over to Dr. Kathleen Seeswalls. Good morning, colleagues. And thank you, Dr. Wall. I trust that you and your loved ones are doing well. And I am so thankful to be here with you virtually this morning. Although I certainly miss coming together through our annual tradition of sharing smiles and laughs, handshakes and hugs, thoughts of our dreams and of our goals. I remain thankful, however, that we can nonetheless be here in large part because of technology. As I look around this room, I think about you. I recollect past convocations, academic plenaries, and I look forward to the day when we can safely reconvene. For now, I invite you to reflect on the following question. If you were to describe in one word how you were feeling about the fall semester, what would it be? Perhaps you thought of the word excited, optimistic, hopeful, or perhaps terms such as concerned, worried, and anxious came to mind. I jotted down earlier the word hopeful, but admittedly, I often find myself thinking, what if? Perhaps the words of noted mathematician and philosopher Alfred North Whitehead may provide some measure of professional solace. The art of progress, Whitehead reflects, is to preserve order amid change, and equally to preserve change amid order. Applied to higher education, Whitehead's words underscored the dual importance of ensuring academic continuity while cultivating change, innovation. As a Pathways Navigator for the Florida Department of Education Student Success Center, I believe that the Guided Pathways model serves as a vehicle for us to at once achieve academic continuity and foster the kind of advancement that our college greatly needs. Defined by the American Association of Community Colleges as an integrated institution-wide approach to student success based on intentionally designed, clear, coherent, and structured educational experiences. Guided pathways as a construct consists of four pillars. The first pillar is mapping program pathways to students and goals. The second, helping students choose and enter a program pathway. The third, helping students stay on path, and the fourth, ensuring that they are learning. 
Undergirding this organizational framework is an equity-minded commitment to the success of all learners, from the developmental education student to the honor student. And as our esteemed colleagues have noted during this morning session, FSCJ has made significant inroads into all four pillars, and yet there is much great work yet ahead of us. Over the past year in particular, as you have heard from Director Sarah Reardon, Dr. Wall, and other colleagues, a team of faculty and academic advisors worked diligently to create over 70 AA baccalaureate transfer roadmaps. And we will turn attention next to collaborations with baccalaureate career and technical education faculty to do much the same in terms of associate in science and bachelor's degrees. The long-term goal, ultimately, is to map every educational program that our college offers. In curriculum and instruction, a team of dedicated professionals works both to support and to inspire excellence in teaching and learning. In curriculum services, led by Director Jennifer Mullins, we look forward to supporting you, our faculty, with both course and program level proposals that you might wish to advance throughout the coming academic year. Under the auspices of academic support services for our many diverse learners, we welcome opportunities through the leadership of the Developmental Education Council to continue serving those who are college preparatory in nature. We do equally so welcome those opportunities through the Library and Learning Commons, led by Executive Dean Tom Mesner, to continue providing online tutoring services as well as library services to your students. And starting next week, on the first day of class, we welcome the opportunity to provide limited campus library services as well as access to our open computer labs for students. Colleagues, in the area of curriculum and instruction, and particularly high impact educational programs, we are delighted, as Dr. Wall had alluded to earlier, to celebrate the work of the Honors Steering Committee and of the Office of the Honors Program, led by Interim Director Allison Hicks. Indeed, we welcome our largest honors cohort to date, even as we find our home, however virtually, here at the South Campus. And we are very thankful that Dr. Jeff Manns, Professor of Biology, will join us as Honors Faculty Coordinator this year. We also wish, as Dr. Avendano and Dr. Wall had noted earlier, to celebrate the leadership of our Uppsala and Eta chapter of Phi Theta Kappa Honor Society faculty advisor, Dr. Mary James, who is also professor of chemistry. Under Dr. James's leadership, we have welcomed over 500 new students to join Phi Theta Kappa since fall 2018. And in yet another high impact educational area, we appreciate the opportunity to serve you as you serve and work with your students in terms of service learning and civic engagement opportunities, particularly through the leadership of Dr. Gemma Burton in the Center for Civic Engagement. We are pleased to announce that in the midst of the pandemic, we have been able to research and design ideas for facilitating online service learning that allows our commitment to college and community to continue despite the coronavirus. And of course, we are delighted to share that the Center for International Education is newly established under the leadership of Associate Director Patty McConnell. And while we are now prepared with great appreciation to a team of dynamic faculty members to facilitate faculty-led study abroad and study USA programs, we will, of course, as Dr. Wall noted, await the right and appropriate time to do so. In the meanwhile, we cordially invite you, the faculty, to consider internationalizing courses that you are teaching so that we may bring the world to our students through the Global Scholars Distinction Program. And if we may proudly share this morning that FSCJ 
has become the first broad access institution outside North Carolina to join the distinguished University of North Carolina Worldview Scholars of Global Distinction program. And again, we could not be more delighted that Dr. Tina Daisy will soon join us as our International Education Faculty Coordinator. Together, colleagues, we, the faculty and staff of FSCJ, are paving guided pathways toward student success. At this tentative time in higher education's history, such an intentionally designed framework facilitates both order amid change and change amid order, transforming our deepest concerns into our greatest capacities. On behalf of the curriculum and instruction team, we welcome opportunities to serve you and your students. And colleagues, we wish you a safe and engaging academic year. Good afternoon to my socially distanced and working remote academic colleagues. My name is Sarah Reardon and I serve as the director of our Bridges Title III grant program. A few weeks ago, I asked Dr. Wall if I could have some time to speak with you today about our new student climate survey. So thank you, Dr. Wall, for allowing me the opportunity. As our program name, Bridges, invokes a call for bridges of collaboration, today I stand here asking for your help. As faculty members, you are part of FSCJ's front line, working towards student success. You have the ability, whether you know it or not, to influence your students' decision making. And specifically, I need your help to garner student participation and completion of our first college-wide student climate survey. As you see on the screen, we have aligned our survey's theme with this year's election. And this is the branding that you'll recognize on any further communication about the survey. Our students' voices matter. So you might be asking why. Why do we need another student survey? I've asked that too, believe me. When I assumed my role with Bridges, I realized there was an opportunity to try to get to know who our students are so that we can become a student-ready institution. And that was through additional quantitative and qualitative data. I wanted to go beyond the traditional indicators of retention and graduation, even beyond the questions that our Community College Survey of Student Engagement, also known as the SESI, Graduate Alumni Survey, and Matriculating Student Survey we deploy here at FSCJ. We have built a survey in-house and customized to the FSCJ student experience. The survey will help us learn more about our enrolled students' attitudes, habits, and behaviors. The instrument demonstrates yet another opportunity to showcase that our college cares about our students and that we strive for a safe, equitable, and inclusive environment for all. We have been very thoughtful in the design of this survey. It has taken us a whole academic year to design this survey. And shout out to my um, data program manager, Dr. Renita Thompson. She's really spearheaded the effort in developing the content for the survey. Over the course of this past year, she has connected with data experts nationwide. She's talked to colleges and universities that have deployed a similar climate survey. And we've also leaned on um, getting information from our students. So pre-COVID, <laughs> last spring, um, before spring break, we actually um, partnered with a few faculty members to pilot the survey. So we went into a few courses. Um, they span from general education to workforce. And we had um, students take the survey. And afterwards, we conducted a few focus groups. So it's very intentionally designed with students in mind. In fact, students help tweak the survey language so that it's very student friendly and engaging to them. So again, why are we doing this? To assess students' experiences, perceptions, and views of FSCJ. We're adding qualitative data to our predominantly quantitative data sets. We're also helping facilitate discussions regarding strategic initiatives, policies, and procedures that impact student success. In fact, we will have unpacked the data and present, we will be able to present the findings for our 2021 Spring 20, College-Wide Data Summit. 
My goal is to make this as actionable as possible. So here's a little bit about the survey mechanics. Working with institutional research, the student success data team, and marketing and communications, we will deploy the first email to solicit participation on September 21st. And we will have the survey open until November 1st. Students will receive a call to action from a student climate ambassador. Each week, an email will be sent with an embedded video from members of our FSCJ family. The first video will be of our number one ambas ambassador, Dr. A, followed by faculty members, staff, and SGA representatives encouraging student participation. Marketing and Communications has also developed a social media campaign for student outreach and awareness. You will note the survey will be open for six weeks, and this is pretty customary for universities and colleges administering climate surveys. We've also been very intentional on our dates, so every student, no matter if they enroll in A, B, or C sessions has an opportunity to participate. We are also very fortunate for the FSCJ Foundation to support this effort. They have offered up funds so we can do randomized drawings for students who complete the survey. We have, uh, we're gonna provide up to 40, $50 checks to students using foundation funds. So the survey will take about 20 minutes for our students to complete. And we have five item sets. Foundationally, we have the campus climate item set. We are also asking them about academic and campus services. So we're asking about their awareness, their use, and their satisfaction of our on-campus resources. We're asking basic needs and financial health. Again, I wanna know more about the whole student experience. And over the summer, we developed two additional item sets related to the pandemic and racial climate. And we will provide more details on these item sets leading up to our launch. So this is my last slide and it's a call to action. I really need your help. We've learned from other colleges that when faculty get involved with promoting surveys, the open rates and the actual survey completion rates significantly increase. I believe it was a community college in Texas that we spoke to where they started out with an 8% participation rate and it after building in faculty participation, students um, opened and completed from 8% to over 70%. And that's due to the fact that at least one person, a student new at their institution, nudged them to take the survey. So please stay tuned to additional survey details. I'll be working with academic affairs leadership to provide additional information. We are going to be developing a, a FAQ for faculty and staff and sending an e-flyer you can post in your Canvas course. Thank you for your time today, and at this time, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. John Woodward, Faculty Senate President. Hello. Cher collègue, this is John Arrington Woodward, Faculty Senate President. I'm speaking to you this morning from a hidden bunker somewhere in the Midwest. The plague is upon us. God save our souls. Pause for a laughter. You know, what once may have been a pretty interesting joke has, has kind of lost a lot of its humor. Other than that, tossed at the waiting crowd beneath the gallows. Now we can only embrace a humor of the abyss, crack, cackling away at our own pointlessness, as that abyss is cackling right now at the hubris of major universities throughout the U.S. And yet, the abyss may also have been chuckling heartily at our own foibles, were it not for the Herculean efforts of our colleagues. Beginning in May, a subcommittee of Faculty Senate began meeting weekly to work through ideas about how we might approach a world where COVID-19 is not subsiding or magically disappearing, and a world where resistance to scientifically informed measures to prevent the spread of the illness would be almost mainstream in parts of the US. We read the tea leaves, so to speak, or rather we read the science and understood our own political situation and the reality of collective human action in the US and realized we would have to abandon face-to-face -face meetings in the fall. Our work rolled up into the committee meeting Dr. Wall established and mentioned earlier to um, a committee to work on large scale transitions to a COVID world in our fall semester and resonated with concerns at that meeting. Our guiding interest as faculty was one to understand that some classes would have to meet face-to-face -face on most of our campuses. 
and two, to attempt to reduce the risk of large-scale disruptions to the semester for those classes by reducing the population on each campus throughout the fall. I believe our caution will prove to have been well-founded. Our hope is that our campuses will be able to remain open and that the services our students rely on will be unaffected. Our approach will also hopefully shrink the possible effect of any potential disease-related disruptions. None of this could have happened without the extra time dedicated to the committee work by our colleagues in administration and my esteemed colleagues, Steve Milchanowski, Cheryl Schmidt, Jason Gibson, Shep Shepard, Ben Clark, Wayne Francis, Catherine Rifkin, Bill Mizell, Webb Skelton, Halen Washington, and Rebecca Levy. I think we owe all of them a round of virtual applause and maybe even a beer purchase once we get back to seeing each other again. I'll allow them to send you all their personal preferences for libations. As we move through this semester, we have a couple of uh, projects on the books, not only these uh, wonderful ideas um, presented by Dr. Wall, but also an attempt to um, reconfigure our approach to academic dishonesty, reinvigorate our concept of rigor as well, even as we move to this online environment, um, and to uh, work on promoting uh, our faculty um, to the community at large using our website and also potentially events if we ever get back face to face again. So I was born in 1973. I know, pretty astonishing. It was an interesting year by all accounts, not just because of my birth. On September 11, 1973, Pinochet took power in Chile and began the wholesale imprisonment and slaughter of peaceful protesters and those who resisted his illegal regime. The mothers, wives, sisters, and brothers of those imprisoned and murdered still scour the Atacama Desert to this day for bits of bones left from their relatives murdered by Pinochet's gangs. But 13 years before I was born, Two events of note took place with striking similarities. On March 21, 69 people were murdered by police in Sharpeville, South Africa, when police opened fire on a peaceful protest of black African men, women, and children. And on this very day in 1960, Jacksonville became the center of the public discourse on race when a rabid gang of thugs attacked and beat a group of protesters sitting at a lunch counter. As the Florida Historical Society describes the event, the violent attack was in response to peaceful lunch counter demonstrations organized by the Jacksonville Youth Council of the NAACP. The attack began with white people spitting on the protesters and yelling racial slurs at them. When the young demonstrators held their resolve, they were beaten with wooden handles that had not yet had metal axe heads attached. While the violence was first aimed at the lunch counter demonstrators, it quickly escalated to include any African American inside of the white mob. Police stood idly by watching the beatings until members of a black street gang called the Boomerangs attempted to protect those being attacked. At that point, police nightsticks joined the baseball bats and axe handles. Bloodied and battered victims of the vicious beatings fled to a nearby church where they sought refuge and comfort from prayer and song. Eventually, the white mob dispersed. As we go through this year, I encourage us all to remember this anniversary of the struggle for human rights, a struggle that is unending and a struggle that wanes into tepid resignation wherever higher education is presented as solely a cog in the Boethius-like wheel of social mobility associated with attaining a degree. Higher education should not be reduced to grades, data points, numbers on a page, assignments passed or failed. At its best, it is a commitment and a dedication to the pursuit of truth, the grappling with fact, the dialectical integration into a co concept of cooperative society as a fundamental human structure, grounded though it perhaps may be on an abyss of meaninglessness. We hold the keys to the gateway to a better humanity in our grasp, but must warn that the path forward is filled with the broken glass of the inhumanity of humanity, 
and that the embracing of truth, whatever that may be, means the possibility of being disabused of our own beliefs and erroneous representations of the truth, whatever that may be. Information about Axe Handle Saturday was effectively censored by the state and our education system for decades. No school children learned about it in their history classes in high school. No memorial stood in Jacksonville. No meaningful attempt to remember an atone has yet been made. The mayor at the time pretended as though it was a minor fracas until pictures of bloodied African Americans were published in Time Magazine, I believe. We have a duty to our collective humanity to at least make sure this type of erasure never happens. As an institution, we have that duty. And I think, as an institution, we have a duty to our students to make uh, sure we offer them an academic experience grounded in equity and truth, no matter its ugliness or its difficulty. Good luck for the semester ahead. And with that, I will turn it to a very valued colleague, someone who has been absolutely invaluable as we have made our way through this rather difficult summer, Dr. Rich Turner. Thank you, Dr. Woodward. Greetings, colleagues. I want to take just a few minutes this morning to discuss faculty remote testing. There are really three services that I'll review this morning. The first is Smarter Services Automated Proctoring Service. That's the service that we quickly launched in the spring, really a response to the pandemic, continued to offer that fully automated service through the summer, and it will be available once again in the coming fall. The next service that I'll talk about this morning is ProctorU Review Plus. ProctorU is a remote proctoring service. In fact, many of our online faculty are familiar with ProctorU having used the Live Plus service. This is a Review Plus service. From the student perspective, it is identical to Live Plus, but slightly different from the service perspective, and you'll see that as I present this morning. And then the third and final service that I'll talk about is Proctor 360, or a very similar service because we are working with three ven or excuse me, two vendors uh, to produce that final product. So this morning, a quick review. Smarter Services Automated Proctoring Services, Proctor U Review Plus, and Proctor 360. As you look at the graphic on the screen, you'll see that I really broke these three services out across the top, Smarter Services Automated Proctoring, Proctor U Review Plus, Proctor 360. Probably the best way to talk about these services is really to compare different processes and how the student or faculty will experience these processes. And so we'll talk about the technology first. The best technology for all of these services is a laptop or a desktop with a webcam running Microsoft OS or Windows. Now it's important to note that Smarter Services Automated Proctoring Service does support Chromebooks. Equally, ProctorU Review Plus supports newer Chromebooks that have four gig memory or higher. But as a pat answer, laptop or desktop with a webcam running Windows or Mac OS, best technology. Password entry in these systems. So Smarter Services Automated Proctoring Service actually pastes the password independent of any operation from the password that was provided by the faculty member when they set it up in Canvas. So it just automatically pastes that password into the portal uh, on behalf of the faculty because they entered it in when they set, in, set up the exam in Canvas. ProctorU Review Plus, the password is entered by a ProctorU proctor. So they look in Canvas, they see the password that you provided, and they actually manually enter that, the student cannot see it, to actually initiate the exam. And then Proctor360 is entered by an FSCJ proctor. So again, much like ProctorU, except the main difference here with Proctor360 is this FSCJ proctor that's actually interacting with the student and interacting with the system. Next is ID validation. In the case of Smarter Services Automated Proctoring Service, that ad ID validation is automated. So in other words, what happens is the student provides their ID at the point of starting the exam and as a faculty member, if you're not familiar with that student, you would need to review that ID after at the exam completion. 
In the case of Proctor U Review Plus, that ID validation happens by the Proctor U Proctor. So again, prior to launching the exam, that Proctor U Proctor is actually verifying the ID of that student prior to initiation. And the exact same thing is true for Proctor 360, the difference being the ID validation is happening by an FSCJ proctor. Next, as we think about processes, is the actual room sweep. So the room sweep for Smarter Services Automated Proctoring it happens at the initiation of the exam, but as the faculty member, you need to review that once the exam is complete. So that video is made available in Canvas, and you would want to review that room pan that the student did because it's just automated, they're just gonna execute it and you would want to review it to ensure the room is clear. In the case of Proctor U Review Plus, that room sweep is guided by the Proctor U Proctor. So the Proctor U Proctor is going to direct the student to pan the webcam, pan the laptop, and if they go too fast or the angle's off, they would direct them to do a portion or all of it again. The same is true for Proctor 360, the difference being that it would be an FSCJ proctor that is guiding the room scan. Examination monitoring. In the case of, in the case of Smarter Services Automated Proctoring Service, the exam monitoring all happens by artificial intelligence. So the student is not being watched by a human, but actually by artificial intelligence that's flagging any suspicious activity. So examples of suspicious activity would be an extra head in the screenshot, the computer attempting to go to an unauthorized location, audio in the room, a missing head on the headshot. All of those things would be flagged, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But again, the monitoring is happening with artificial intelligence. With Proctor U Review Plus, the exact same thing is happening. Although a live Proctor U did the ID check, the room scan, and actually initiated the exam, once the exam started, unbeknownst to the student, that Proctor U Proctor backed out of the exam and left just artificial intelligence monitoring that student. And then finally, Proctor 360. In this case, the exam would be monitored by the FSCJ Proctor the entire length of the exam. They would be monitoring more than one student at a time, but they would be monitoring that student the entire length of the exam. Next is the post-exam review. In the case of Smarter Services Automated Proctoring, the artificial intelligence flags potential suspicious activity, indicates what that suspicious activity was, two heads in the screen, and the faculty member needs to go back and review those flags to determine if indeed inappropriate conduct occurred and take the appropriate steps. With Proctor U Review Plus, the Proctor U Proctor reviews their artificial intelligence, any suspicious activity, then they watch the entire testing session in an accelerated format, and if any activity was deemed inappropriate after their review, they then submit that through Canvas a report to the faculty what the inappropriate activity was and the time mark so that you can actually go back to the video and review. And then finally with Proctor 360, there is no post-exam review by our proctors because again, they were reviewing the entire exam. They were there for the whole exam, so there is no post-review. So post-exam feedback. Again, I touched upon it with Smarter Services. It's those flags and the indication of what those flags are where the faculty member would go and review those. In the case of Proctor U Review Plus, it's that report. After they review the artificial intelligence flags, after they review the session in accelerated format, if there is inappropriate activity, they would submit a report. And then finally with Proctor 360, if inappropriate activity is detected by one of our FSCJ proctors, they would stop the inappropriate activity, but then equally they would submit a report as well to you. Now all of these services come at a cost, and it's important for us to understand that cost. As we think about Smarter Services Automated Proctoring, it is $5 per, per exam. So 30 students, you get it, two exams, there's 60, $5 per exam, regardless of exam length. In the case of Proctor U Review Plus, the cost is twice that much. It is $10 per exam, regardless of the time length of the exam. And then finally, Proctor 360. Again, here we are using our proctors um, the cost between the technology and our proctors is approximately $13 for a two-hour exam. A three-hour exam would be approximately $19.50. 
So it is the most expensive option of the proctoring options. So lastly, the point to touch up on is the current status for these faculty remote proctoring options. Smarter Services Automated Proctoring is live. It can be assigned right now in Canvas in the Canvas shell. ProctorU Review Plus, we tested it in Smarter Services Sandbox yesterday. We'll be testing it in our Canvas Sandbox next week. Expect an email probably late next week announcing training in, in mid-September of how to make those assignments in Canvas if you want the test to be uh, administered and monitored by ProctorU Review Plus. So expect that email coming probably late next week with training mid-September. Proctor 360, again, not, not fully completed yet. We do have two vendors that are providing a product, but expect in the coming weeks updated information as well as training to launch Proctor 360. In closing, all of these services cost the college money. And it's important to consider the need for proctor testing, the service level needed, as well as no cost alternatives to proctor testing. At this time, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Mark Bosey, who will share information about how the Academy for Teaching and Learning continues to support your work. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I was asked to be brief today, so uh, I promise to be brief, Dr. Wall, no matter how long that takes. Um, I want to give a quick shout out to the folks in here that are just making this all possible. Um, in fact, uh, to remember why we're here in the service that we all serve to the college and community, there are only two people sitting in the entire auditorium, and both of them were my students. And it's just nice to see them here, knowing everything they've gone through, and they've graduated, and here they are. So just to remember that we're all here for them. Our Academy members I want to introduce uh, for 20 and 21, Director Dr. Susan Slavitz, representing South Campus, Associate Directors Audrey Ante and Professor Janiah Jones. Representing Humanities here at South Campus, we have Professor Scott Kaysen, Professor Matthew Kies at Deerwood, and he's the one that handles all your travel uh, requests, so it would be really nice to Matthew. Dr. Terry Dyer-Kramer at North Campus, Dr. Sam Ertenberg downtown, and Sharon Uskokovich, librarian at Kent Campus. You can email any of them at academy at fscj.edu, or you can get their individual contact information through the website, training.fscj.edu. Click on the Academy for Teaching and Learning link, and then there's like a Contact Us page, so look for that. Um, I want to uh, stress to everybody that's watching right now that all of these people worked really hard. All of these amazing faculty worked hard this summer to make sure that we were prepared for when you came back this fall. So just a huge shout out to this, this amazing group of faculty members you see here, including our newest member, Scott Kaysen, who has helped a lot this summer as well. Our FRCs, our Faculty Resource Centers, they are available. Um, those that reside inside of the libraries, you need to check uh, and make sure that those Schedules are open as well, um, but security can open these places. Um, we have had faculty using these resources, um, so please um, contact security if you need access to open. Otherwise, like downtown, you can use your key card to get in. Um, just a little heads up that last year in 1920, we had nearly 10,000 total visits to the FRCs. So we see that we're actually um, doing the right thing and promoting the right services there. And that is including the fact that we closed down halfway through spring and all of summer. So um, the year before that, we had about 7,000. So it's really gone up and up and up each year. So the reasons for the visits, uh, computer and software, technical help, printing and scanning, and open labs. The folks that work in those resource centers are our faculty development specialists. And um, they are available. While most of the availability will be virtual, you can, by appointment, schedule to meet with those FDSs face to face. They have met with a lot of you faculty this summer um, and helped tape, classroom, uh, tape classes, put them online, and everything like that. These are the folks that have been busy seven days a week, all summer helping all of the faculty move their courses and everything online. They will continue that great service through this fall. 
hit them up. Dr. Avendano talked about innovation earlier. These folks are innovative, they're creative, they can find new ways to get you um, engaging your students in your online coursework. You can also email academy at fscj.edu to get their contact information, but the website training.fscj.edu does have a link for the faculty resource centers, which does contain the contact information for these uh, FDSs. Speaking of the uh, training website, training.fscj.edu, we had over uh, 44,000 views last year on that website. So we know you guys are visiting, you guys are accessing content there. So we wanted to make sure that we built robust um, resources for you all. So if you go to training.fscj.edu, click on the Academy for Te Teaching and Learning page, and you'll see the slide that you're seeing here. On the bottom right hand side, you'll see a faculty transition page and a faculty resource repository. That faculty transition page has boilerplate syllabus language, info on proctoring, description of new modalities, setting up virtual office hours, and more that you may need as you transition into the fall. That faculty resource repository is faculty, it contains faculty created resources on how to engage your students both online and uh, synchronously and asynchronously. There are discipline specific trainings that we've recorded over the summer in place there and some of those FDSs have created trainings that are on there so please um, visit those pages as you get ready to deliver your fall courses uh, next week. Just some quick hits uh, to let you know how the Academy has been working this past year and if you guys have been involved. We had 262 full-time faculty that enrolled in PD in the last year. We had over 100 at the colloquium, the Engaging Students Synchronously program. Um, that Engaging Students Synchronously program was a just-in-time training that we developed within a week to make sure you were ready in the spring when we moved uh, from the face-to-face -to, -face to on online modality. So we can get that up and running and you will attend. So please let me know if that stuff comes up again, if anything you need ever. The Math Mini Conference had over 120 participants. PD Day, um, Science Symposium at 70, Virtual Learning Week had 100 participants. So just so you know, you are coming, uh, we are offering, and we'll continue to do so. This year is gonna be a little differently. Um, these will be virtually at this point. So Science Symposium is virtual this year, and that is October 16th, 2020, Professional Development Day. And in between Science Symposium and Professional Development Day, we will also have a Student Services Professional Development Day, and we'll have a Virtual Learning Week as well. So look for um, ad, ads on those things. In the spring, we, we start back up with a Math Mini Conference, and then our Colloquium and Faculty Awards on April 9th. So last year, this is the question that I get a lot, travel. What are we gonna do with it? Um, just to start out, last year in 1920, 73 faculty requested travel funds, up to $2,000 each. We approved $83,775.69. Due to uh, conference cancellations, um, plane booking, hotel cancellations, et cetera, the, only amount, the amount that we ended up distributing was $33,125.95. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't roll into this next year, but we do have $75,000, once again, to offer for faculty, travel, and professional development. So how does that work in this um, era where we, we're not really allowed to travel? Um, we are offering, as long as you have approval from your supervisor and the AVP in your department, you may uh, apply for uh, off-site or off-campus travel. A lot of the requests coming in are for virtual conferences. Yes, bring those in. You can request uh, and put in applications for virtual conferences. We wanna use all $75,000 this year. So please apply, it's on the Academy uh, page. There's a link that said, as of yesterday morning, it said travel, but um, today it says faculty travel slash virtual conferences. So that's on training.fscj.edu. Click on the Academy for Teaching and Learning and then click on that travel slash virtual conferences page to apply. Matt Kyes is waiting for your applications. So hopefully you guys have noticed uh, there is a new uh, learning management system for training and development and faculty development. It's called My Learning. It is uh, housed within Bridge, which is the actual LMS. 
bridge is owned by Instructure, who owns Canvas as well. So we were having a hard time getting faculty and staff to enroll in PD through Campus Solutions. We'd have to encode in Campus Solutions, then you'd have to go from there to a different place in Blackboard, and then come back to try to complete the grades in there, and then trying to dig up your transcripts was a whole lot of work. So we finally got the funding, and we've got in place now um, a solution that was built by the same folks that we trust in Canvas, in Structure, Bridge. Um, to access my learning, go to the Employee tab in my FSCJ, or you can go to training.fscj.edu, click on the Professional Development link. Um, we have over 100 courses in there, both asynchronously and synchronous, ready to go, um, and we look to keep building that out. Um, there are two, if you can keep that slide up for one second, there's one, uh, the learning library is where you're going to see all of your asynchronous courses, and then there's a training calendar where you can actually schedule out um, the synchronous sessions that we offer. They are all virtual at this point, but let's say you've got, uh, you're teaching a class from uh, two to four on a Thursday, you know you have a little bit of space after that, you can go onto that training calendar, see if we're offering anything during those times and sign up. We have Canvas training on there, we've got conferences training on there, WebEx training, et cetera. So please check out my learning. These are some of the certificate programs that we are, uh, that we have been refreshing, uh, if you will. Um, and all of these can, you can find these all on training.fscj.edu under the certificate programs link. Our effective online student engagement is the one we developed with help from the Fall Continuity Group this summer. Um, we got it up and running with eight wonderful faculty um, and, and built them out within about a month and had them online. And we offered them synchronously last week. And we had over 80 uh, participants last week just take these, these courses, effective online student engagement. Active learning, we've refreshed that. Honors, diversity. Diversity, we put an extra emphasis on that. Thank you to Lisa Moore for joining. Um, technology, we've, we've looked at some of the technology we need now based on these new circumstances. Communication, multimedia, we have a lot more uh, teachers asking how to, um, faculty members asking how to build a YouTube channel and how to build a web page for their students, et cetera. So we beef that up and we have a multimedia certificate now. And then finally on there, we have our student success certificate which was built with um, the, uh, a combination of student services and faculty members coming together under the Bridges Grant um, to create some robust training on how to um, work with our students from both perspectives. So please look out for information on all of those coming up. This, I uh, wanted to go back to the effective online student engagement program that we're offering. Um, it's a four course program delivered both asynchronously and synchronously. Um, as of last week, we did it synchronously, and it's the four courses are engaging course design, engaging students synchronously, asynchronous active engagement, and then meaningful online assessment. Um, we asked around to uh, your fellow faculty members, deans, AVPs, et cetera, on who was kind of leading the path forward in those areas, and they helped design those courses. Um, and, and the the I highly recommend if you can make it to the synchronous ones, come to those because you've got Mary Lee Keneal sharing exactly what she does with her students. Janiah Jones sharing exactly how she works with some of her students online. So please uh, um, plan on attending uh, September 25th and October 2nd. And just a heads up to any of the administrators in the building uh, or watching uh, online. Those two dates, if you can please uh, hold that time dear for your faculty to uh, attend those. Asynchronously, we are looking to also offer those uh, mid-September, but really you're gonna have a much better experience in that synchronous environment. The Academy for Teaching and Learning is proud to uh, announce that we partnered with Lumen Circles Fellowships. Through fellowships, uh, we are providing opportunities for faculty to explore teaching strategies to support student success together with a virtual community of peers. This is the uh, result of many faculty coming together over the last couple years to figure out what are these some of these external products or external faculty development programs that are out there. Well, we tested them. We stuck our feet in the, we did not just stuck our feet in the water, we jumped in. And we had faculty actually go through all of the programs. And um, with a combination of um, 
determination and hard work. Those faculty came together at the end, talked about the strengths and weaknesses of all of those, and we came to uh, Lumen Circles as one of those ones that will help develop a community of practice for scholarship within our um, faculty. So please look out for the emails with the Lumen Circles Fellowship opportunity. Um, also, Packback. Uh, we um, tried out Packback for the last year, and we've decided to bring Packback Questions back. What Packback Questions is, is it's an art artificial intelligence supported online discussion platform focused on Socratic questioning. Students are challenged to post thoughtful questions and responses, receiving instant feedback on the quality of their post via Packback's curiosity score. The platform is equipped to save instructors time while maximizing an instructor's impact. We have multiple members on the academy that have used it and sing its praises. So um, we also talked about that during our engaging online student, uh, effective online engaging, engaging student uh, engagement. So we know that it's working. We know uh, faculty want to use it. So we're bringing it back. The academy has partnered with them and look out for the emails that are promote those two opportunities. There will be like interest forms that you'll fill out um, with your contact information and we'll reach back out to you and make sure that we get um, packed back built into your canvas shell etc so hang on for those uh, messages um, if at any time uh, during the semester you have any questions you want a extra training on something please reach out reach out directly to me uh, academy at fscj.edu I do share that with dr. Susan Slavitz the FTS is so Anything you need from us, please let me know. I won't know until you let me know. Um, so thank you for your time, and I want to please welcome back our provost, Dr. John Wall. Mark, thank you so much. I'd like to thank our facilities team, security team who are out here supporting us today. I want to thank the Wilson Center team and the TV studio crew. You all have been outstanding and have made this so easy for all of us. And I hope that it is working for you that are out there watching this through the link. I'd also like to thank all of this morning's presenters for your time this morning and also for all the work that you are doing behind the scenes that you are sharing today. Colleagues, after much preparation, we are 84 hours from Monday morning. I have confirmed we are go for launch. So if you've got stuff to do, you better go get after it. Please be safe, stay inspired, stay connected and reach out if you need help. Let's make it a great year. Onward.